pleasure to be here with uh, all of you. It's um, it's very exciting uh, for me to uh, be in Texas. Um, people have said for years you're just a Texas wannabe, <laughs> and uh, it's one of, one of the things that um, happens uh, all the time, and it has to, for a good part of my life. I've always worn a cowboy hat, and um, uh, especially in Israel, people walk up to me and they only say one word uh, when they they go Texas, and I kind of want to say yeah. I said no, uh, California, and they go California. How can you be wearing a cowboy hat, California? And so I have to go through all of those um, kind of explanations. And uh, so um, we're here with uh, we have. Um, family uh, living in um, uh, up near uh, Corinth, uh, near Denton. Uh, we have uh, families and uh, family in Houston and um, we're in Wimberley uh, tonight. Um, I'm going to uh, attempt this thing again, Lori, where we're, I'm going to share the screen and I want to put up a, uh, um, some slideshows. Okay. Uh, let's see if, <laughs> I hope this works. Okay. Worked earlier, but um, let's see if it goes now. Yes, All there right. it is. Perfect. I, okay. Um, this is a, a, a slide that I had a, a long time, but I, I, I ran across it today and I thought it is so uh, appropriate because um, I'm wondering how, uh, first of all, without making any bones about it, um, I've certainly been uh, uh, a Trump uh, supporter. And um, we're going through this uh, period of time where all of this is uh, kind of um, uh, in a little bit of an uproar. But this slide says, our future presidents, our future members of Congress, our future pastors and opinion leaders are sitting in college classrooms right now. And of course, uh, that imp implies the question, what are they learning? And um, What's, uh, what's coming uh, in the future? Abraham Lincoln said the philosophy of the classroom in one generation will be the philosophy of the government in the next. And I think uh, there was a great deal of truth in that in the 1860s. Perhaps there's even a greater deal of truth uh, in it uh, these days. So I wanted to open with um, these uh, questions. I certainly don't think I'll answer them fully. Uh, but does God intervene in elections? And I would suppose that uh, this, uh, this group is uh, generally a Bible study. And so um, it uh, would probably, most people would answer, well, yeah, probably, or he can. Or do we get in this constitutional republic that we are part of where we get to vote, do we get just what we deserve. Are we getting what we deserve at this point? And I say, we, I'm talking about uh, the people in the United States, all of us, do we get what we deserve? Or maybe the question is, how do we get out of this mess? And um, I think one of the direct answers to that, God spoke to uh, Solomon and of course, then it was uh, transferred to the chosen people who protected this uh, part of scripture. And I think it's appropriate for us um, uh, as uh, basically Gentiles who uh, accepted uh, Jesus as the Messiah, um, that we can be called by um, uh, his name as his, uh, his people. And this is um, Second Chronicles 7. And it's something that I'm sure is familiar to uh, most of you. You may have heard it uh, over again and again on the National Day of Prayer. And um, God said this after the temple was dedicated. And by the way, it was the start of um, the, de the dedication of the new temple. There was never one before this. Solomon built it uh, from scratch. And um, so when he dedicated, and, and the reason I'm, pointing that out is we are now uh, just in going into the second day of Hanukkah, which is called also the Feast of Dedication. And um, it certainly has a uh, biblical basis to it. And uh, that's a whole teaching in itself. 
But if you want to see what uh, Jesus had to say or had to do with Hanukkah, um, you can look at, and we won't go there now, but you can look at John 10, verse 22. It says, uh, basically, it gives the whole setting. It says that um, he went to the Feast of Dedication, and that's how it is in the NIV and uh, perhaps in King James, I forget. But it's hidden. It should say Hanukkah so that we would understand it's the same festival that Jesus went to to celebrate that the Jews uh, were celebrating in uh, Jerusalem at the time that Jesus was there. So it's not, Hanukkah is not something that was invented by the Jews, and this was told to me as a kid. Well, they just invented it to keep their kids from um, wanting to have Christmas and Christmas trees. That's far from uh, what the truth is. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles 7, 13. And this is what God says. He said, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or I command locusts to devour the land, or I send a plague among my people. That really should jump out at us. We are not only the United States, but the world has really been impacted by a plague during these last 10 months or so. And I don't have to tell you that. We're, we've all been impacted by that. And then he says, if my people, my people who are called by my name, God says, will humble themselves. See, this starts with an if. It's a big if. If my people called by my name will humble themselves, that is not an easy thing to do, especially not after the wonderful introduction that I got from Lori. You know, how am I going to humble myself after that? Well, believe me, I have much to be humble about. So if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, seek my will, and turn from their wicked ways, then, God says, then, if they do it, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. We all know that our land is in a great need of healing. So I'm going to move on, but that is, that's the basis. That's how we get out of this mess if we really turn to God for his healing, um, it can uh, get us out of this mess. I ran across this picture, and it's a picture of a fellow Marine um, in Vietnam. And what I especially like about it is that he had drawn this on the side of his helmet, in God we trust. And I used to see lots of helmets like this, by some, this is a young looking Marine, uh, by some Marines that looked a lot older and grizzled and tough. And um, they had things like, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And God's word, to me especially, was never more living and more real. And God intervened so many times um, to save my life. And um, and I know that. I don't have to prove that to anybody else. That's something that I know. And when you, when you think about these things, these are hooks you can hang your hat on the rest of your life. If God did it in combat, why can't I believe him um, to uh, get me out of these minor kind of things? Anyway, in God we trust. You, do, I'm, you might know this and maybe not, it is the motto of our nation. And it was made the motto in 1956 by President Eisenhower. He officially signed a document. And um, the Congress passed it. The Senate passed it. It came uh, to the president's desk without one vote against it and without any debate. It went through the House and Senate without any debate. And President um, Eisenhower signed it. These four words are the essence of our country. These four words are the foundation on which our great nation rests. In God we trust. That's the reason why there is compassion and goodness in our land. 
why we can speak our minds without fear, like what we're doing right now, and why this country has prospered and risen like none other in history. Here, like nowhere else in history, God is trusted, and his will was allowed to be the basis for the rule of law that uh, we are to live by. Um, you, you all know this verse that's in the first chapter of Genesis, and it's a little more flowery when it's um, put in King James language. It says, and God said, it's, this is important, this is the point of all this, God speaks. And when God said, let there be light, how, how uh, it's flowery because, and, and if you're in Israel, they're going to tell you God speaks in Hebrew. I'm sure if you're in um, Norway, they're going to tell you God speaks in Norwegian. But in Hebrew, it's two words. It's not let there be light. It's light be. Light be. That's all he said. And guess what happened? <laughs> no question about it. There was light. He spoke it into existence. There was, at this time, there was no light uh, in the universe. And he spoke it into existence. I looked up some facts about light, and it's part of a law of physics. The law of physics is a pattern that nature obeys without exception. There's no exceptions to it. The speed of light measures 186,000 miles per second. It's quick. No matter if the light comes from a child's little flashlight or it comes from a star galaxies away, Mathematically, there is an exact speed of light that doesn't change, and as far as I know, that speed of light has not changed from the moment God said, light be. It's always the same. God speaks into existence these laws that don't vary. It's why you and I can breathe. It's why we're on a planet that everything is right for life for us and all those kind of things that you know about. The universe is governed by laws that are dependable, they're immutable, they're absolute, they're universal, and they're mathematically exact. And they were spoken into existence by our God of the universe. Just think of that. He spoke it in not only light, but everything else um, that he spoke at that time became instantly what he wanted. Genesis 1, 6 says, God, let there be a firmament. Um, 1, 9, God said, let the waters under heavens be gathered together. 1, 11, God said. 1, 14, God said. 1, 20, God said. 24, God said. God said. God said. And 29. And you know what? When he was done saying these things, he took a look at him and he said, it is tov miod. In Hebrew, it is very good. It wasn't just good. It was very good. When God speaks something like that into existence, it's still in existence. And that's how the world operates. He said something else. In Genesis 12, it says the Lord had said to Abram. So what we're reading in Genesis 12 is something he'd already said before. And when he said it, he meant it. And this thing that he said then became a law that is still in effect. He said, I'll make you, Abram, into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I'll make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. Think of that. We talk about Abram like he's somebody, maybe he was our great-grandfather. It's somebody not too distant from us. And yet, in fact, he lived um, 38 3,800 years ago or something like that. And yet we talk about him like it's somebody we know. Well, we know him from God's word because once God said the rest of what I'm going to finish in a minute, once God said it, Abraham did what? He believed it. And so God called him his friend. He's the only one I see in scripture that God said, this is a friend of mine. Um, the next thing God said this, and this is really the heart of what we're going to talk about tonight, God says, I'm going to bless those who bless you, Abram, 
And by the way, when he says this to Abram, we find later in scripture that it also goes to Abraham's son and to his son and to his um, followers. I mean, his um, men, uh, people, <laughs> I got lost there for a minute. His progeny forever. It's still in operation. I'm going to bless those who bless you, meaning if you are a blessing to the Jews, I'm going to bless you. And the flip side of that coin is and I'm going to curse those who curse you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And I don't have time to cite all of the Nobel Prize winners who are Jewish over and over again. They have brought things to this world. I, we were talking today or yesterday about um, the uh, sock vaccine which knocked out polio and the Sabin vaccine and the Sabin um, that came after that. Both are Jewish doctors. It just about eliminated polio and something when we were kids, that was a scourge. Um, pools, swimming pools and places were all shut down and through Abraham's descendants, um, it was, it was uh, eliminated just about. Okay, anyway. Um, there's many things. It's why we were, um, my wife and I were certainly um, believing that uh, this um, vaccine uh, for the COVID-19 that seems to be coming online, um, we thought it would be coming out of Israel. Well, it probably came out some, of some Jewish scientists, and you and I may never know who really was uh, behind this thing, but God said, and you can read it right on the bottom of the screen, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So many medical advances have come from the Jewish people. There's another uh, scripture that it, um, it actually has something to do with the election going on um, right now, which is not finished yet. Just like Yogi Berra has always said, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. And I've been listening. I, she's not even warming up yet, so it ain't over yet. Anyway, Joel 3, 1 and 2 says, In those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Take my word for it. As someone who's been in Israel nearly 100 times over the last 40-some years, the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem are restored um, probably like they were at the time of Solomon. So there's a uh, commonality in this verse that means these things are happening now. And God says, I'm going to gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is the valley of judgment. And there I will enter into judgment against them. Who's he bringing down? Look back one line and it says nations. How does he do that? I'm convinced that this has happened over and over again throughout history. And it's been a study of mine looking at uh, little kingdoms and uh, small lands and giant lands as well. How did they treat the Jews? How did they treat Abraham's descendants? And how did they treat the land of Israel? Now, God says, I'm judging nations on these kind of things. We are in a nation and our nation can be in a judgment from God. And the judgment can be a blessing or the judgment can be a cursing. And um, everyone in their right minds wants to have our nation blessed by God and not be cursed by God. Anyway, he says, I'm going to enter into judgment against them, against those um, um, nations. And here's what he's going to judge them on concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. God calls my people Israel. He calls them his inheritance. And uh, if you've ever seen families split up and get um, all men out of shape and sue each other and everything, it's usually over an inheritance that's been left to them and hasn't been handled very well. God says, don't mess with my will. Don't mess with my inheritance. And he says, my inheritance are the people of Israel. And here's the two things that nations are judged on. They scattered my people among the nations. 
we can read about nations that came in and drove the Jews out of the land or slaughtered the Jews. And we know all that stuff. But what about the ones who kept the people scattered? There have been times when God has called his scattered children of, of uh, Abraham, called them back to the land. And there were people, uh, nations who said, nope, they can't go and they won't allow them to go. So we'll look at that in a moment. Who did that sort of thing? Who kept the Jews out of the land when God was saying, come on back, it's time for you to return. And here's the other thing I'm going to judge nations on. Did you divide up my land? The land that God reserved for his people is a tiny little sliver of land on the face of the whole earth. And every time a nation has tried to slice it up to divide it, they've been judged for doing that. And um, this is the kind of question that I wish that I was able to have asked um, presidential candidates over the years. Sometimes they'd give you an opportunity to try to uh, email in a question. And my question always was, does God judge nations? And I hope they would answer the 17 or 21 people who are on the stage wanting to be president. And they, I, I assume they'd all say, oh yes, he certainly does. And then the follow-up question is, what's it based on? Well, it's based on these two things. Have you scattered um, my people and have you divided up my land? As an example of trying to divide up the land, we, meaning the U.S. government up until this last administration, have consistently tried to make Israel, this tiny little country, give up a third of their land and develop a two-state solution, give it to the Palestinians, who would immediately be at war with Israel. But the worst thing is to divide the land again. It is tiny. And so one of the the first books that I wrote is called The Rise and Fall of the British Empire. And it looks at the British Empire based on this scripture. What did they do to the people? And what did they do to the land? One of the things that they did in the 1930s when the Jews in Europe were trying to escape from Hitler um, was the British who were running Palestine at that time said, sorry, there's no more room for you in this country. At that time, there was less than uh, half a million uh, people in the land. And they said, no more room, sorry, you can't come in. Six million Jews died in Europe because of the British stand on that. Today, there's over nine million people in Israel, and there's still plenty of room. So that was an empire that was judged on that. And then they did almost the unthinkable. They took, went to the next step, and they started to divide the land again and again. And a nation, and I'm talking about the British Empire, that took 400 years to build itself and became the largest empire in the history of the world. You remember this, I think, from fifth grade. Um, at least it's about the only thing I remember from any of the history classes I had. And it was this saying that the sun never sat on the British Empire because they had colonized all around um, the entire planet. And in a mere 40 years, they lost everything. As today, they're just a tiny island hanging off of Europe. They can't even seem to get out of the um, mess that they're in. Anyway, I'll, that's, we'll, we'll be covering this in the future, how to destroy your nation in two easy methods. and. Um, and then I wrote a book, <laughs> I sound like some song uh, writer, you know, and then I wrote and I, if I had my piano here, I couldn't play that anyway. Um, it, it's about how Germany, which was a great empire, which was certainly by all accounts was called a um, Christian nation, the, the nation where um, Martin Luther and others rose up and had the Reformation started there and changed so many things as far as the world goes. And then how 
Um, Germany was the first country that had the Bible printed in their own language so they could read it. They didn't have to go to a library and get a Latin version that they couldn't read anyway. So this was the background of Germany and it was a, a highly uh, successful nation. And how did they destroy themselves? Well, it's pretty obvious with the Holocaust and the destruction of um, six million Jews and all of those kind of things that, um, and I look into what were the real hidden reasons that the Holocaust happened? And is it possible for a nation to do this again today? Yes, it's possible. And um, that's another um, uh, book that uh, we'll be looking at in the future. And then the one we're gonna talk about tonight um, is the next one. It's called The Accidental Presidents who became the blessers of Israel. And I call them accidental presidents because there were times in their lives um, that they did not want to be president. They did everything to keep from doing it. Others of them did everything to become president and nothing was working out. And it all looks like it was an accident the way they got into position. But you can count those heads up there on Mount Trumpmore. And there's, uh, there's five heads up there, and not the four that are on Rushmore. Um, and these are five presidents that, at the time I was doing this research, I felt all did something significant for Israel, for the Jewish people, that brought a blessing on our nation. And um, I will we'll take a look at some of those tonight very briefly. This is is Mount Rushmore. Every, everyone is um, familiar with it. It was a, uh, it, I particularly love Mount Rushmore. I've been there a number of times now because uh, I continue to play baseball for uh, South Dakota. And the name of our team are the Rushmores. And so we, ha we seem to have a, <laughs> a, a bigger than usual uh, connection um, to this place. But um, I took the five that uh, we're dealing with, and um, on my own, I, I, I got another mountain, and it um, took me quite a while to carve their faces in it. I mean, obviously, that isn't true, but it's uh, Truman and Johnson and Nixon and Reagan and um, Donald Trump. Uh, and so we'll, uh, we won't talk about uh, all of them tonight uh, because... Uh, I'm dangerous when this happens because I, it seems to me I've studied each one of them um, so much and you learn all kinds of things that you could never put in a book because there's just too much there. And today we had the opportunity with um, my sister-in-law and her husband and my wife, we went back to the Johnson Ranch and uh, I'd been there um, a number of times before. And um, you, you just kind of look for little clues. What was he really like? And um, and I must say um, that in Texas, I've been surprised over the years whenever I've taught about Lyndon Johnson. Uh, 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 there has not been a big fan club where people would immediately open their shirts and show Johnson t-shirts and everything else like that. Um, usually the response has been when I've shown what he did for the Jews, which most of this is hidden and it's unknown because much of what he did was actually illegal uh, during those times. Um, when they hear this, the standard uh, answer has usually been a response has been, well, I got to rethink what I think about the old Linden. And um, I hope that, um, as you may get familiar with these five presidents, you're gonna see a side to them that really has been kept hidden, not necessarily by them, but uh, certainly by uh, the newspapers. And very briefly, this is uh, Harry Truman is the first one on the far right of uh, Mount Trumpmore. <laughs> and uh, what he did, he went against all of his cabinet, against all of his advisors, in 1948, and he recognized as the president of the United States, the new state of Israel when it was announced. He was the, he led, we were the first nation to do this. And it changed everything for uh, baby Israel because now they were accepted as a full-blown nation and they could do things 
minutes before they weren't allowed to do upon pain of death. They could buy weapons to defend themselves. There were five Arab nations lined up on their borders as Truman signed this, ready to attack, basically against an unarmed state. Prior to this, just to get weapons, they had to buy them in Europe and maybe Czechoslovakia, take them apart, put them inside of motors and tractors and things, ship the tractors in, and then reassemble all of this under pain of death. If they were caught by the British, um, they could be hung for doing these kinds of things. As soon as Truman signed this document, I love this document because there was no whiteout. Um, there weren't the, the kind of computers. I mean, you'd never put a document like this in front of the president or even the president of your organization that uh, you might um, be part of with glaring errors in it. Um, you just wouldn't do it. And so with his pen, Harry Truman um, added things uh, before he signed it. No one knew what Israel was going to be called at this moment. This was actually, um, you can see at the bottom of the page, it says 611. It was 11 minutes after 6 p.m. in Washington, D.C. In Israel, it was 11 minutes after midnight, and the British mandate for Palestine had expired at midnight. And so I don't know why Truman waited 11 minutes, but uh, he did when he signed it. And then he actually crossed out the words Jewish state because nobody knew uh, what the name of the country was because then someone came in and, hey, Mr. President, we just found out they named it Israel. And he wrote down the state of Israel. And uh, I get excited to see this document every time because it's in his own handwriting. And I imagine what it must have been like for him to scratch things out and to write in the state of Israel. And he spelled it correctly. Um, he, he was a good speller. Um, anyway, that's one little thing that Truman did. He did much more, but uh, we don't have time for that. And then there's this fellow that um, you're probably uh, somewhat familiar with. And this is a picture out at the Johnson uh, Ranch. And the big tall fellow standing there with the blue arrow pointing to him is uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, grandfather, Sam Ely Johnson. And uh, he was a big, tall, former Civil War um, soldier. And um, when the Civil War was over, uh, he, went, he came back home to the hill country and he and his brothers started driving cattle. They'd go round up longhorns uh, during the the war had, had gotten loose. Nobody knew who they belonged to. I guess there wasn't a lot of branding going on at that time. They'd round them up, they'd pen them up, and then when they'd get a herd together, they'd drive them up along the Chisholm Trail all the way to Abilene, Kansas. And he made enough money that he could buy property out there uh, in, the, in the area of Stonewall, Texas. And um, to his right, is a little girl and there's an arrow pointing to her. That's his daughter and her name is Jessie. And um, Jessie um, actually uh, assisted in the birth of Lyndon Johnson. Um, and she was his aunt. And um, now uh, we, we were at the, the home there where uh, Lyndon was born in that house. Um, over the years, that house kind of fell down and, and they rebuilt it, a replica of it. Lyndon was born in that house, and about a quarter of a mile down the road was his, his grandfather's house. And he talked about um, toddling down that road to his grandpa's house uh, many times. And he said that one time, maybe more than that, he told the story many times, so there's probably some element of truth to it. He said that on his grandpa's knee, his grandfather said to him, Lyndon, remember, take care of the Jews. They are God's chosen people. Consider them your friends and help them any way you can. Now, that torch was really carried by his Aunt Jessie. And all of her life, this was the one theme in her life. She was a member of an organization called the Christadelphians just as her dad, Sam Ely Johnson, was himself. And eventually, 
Lyndon's father also joined that organization and they were very pro-Israel. And Jesse was one of the first women in Texas who joined an organization called, um, <laughs> what was the name of that organization? Anyway, Zionists or Zionist Organization of America. And she was one of the first women in it. And that was a theme all of her life. And so when it came time to do something for the Jews, uh, Lyndon already had this seed implanted in him very early in life, just as that seed was planted in Harry Truman when Harry was about six years old. This picture of Lyndon sitting on the porch of that house, um, I believe he looks like uh, six or seven years old at that time. Um, this is uh, Lyndon's Aunt Jessie, and Aunt Jessie hovered over him all of his life, helped him in going to college. After he got out of college, he lived with her in Houston while he was teaching in high school. And some of these pictures, like in the middle, you can see when he came back as a senator, Jesse was there and he has his arm around her. Here's another picture of Lyndon on a horse waving his hat, and there's Jesse right next to him. He would have her at the dining room table when he was president at the ranch. And he would um, lean back and look at Aunt Jessie after uh, you'd have heads of state sitting across from her at the table. And he'd always say, Aunt Jessie, uh, is there uh, anything you'd like to ask the president of uh, Germany? And then the big smile would come on his face as he was, was quiet uh, for a moment, which was something unusual. And Jesse would lean across the table, look, the, whether it was the Queen of England or the President of Germany, look him right in the eye and say, what have you done lately for the Jews? And uh, that was the theme of her life. She kept Lyndon, who was very difficult to keep on a straight path, she kept Lyndon on the one path that she was designed to do, and that was reminding him always to do things to be a blessing to the Jews. And uh, I'm not going to go into what he, well, yeah, I'll give a hint. It's possible, and all of this was illegal when he was doing it, it's possible that as a congressman, he was able to sneak into Texas four to 500 Holocaust, well, they weren't Holocaust survivors. These were Jews he got out of Europe before they uh, went into the camps. And um, it's, a, it's a real incredible story. So he was a blessing to the Jews. If FDR had ever found this out, it would have been the end of Lyndon because it was going against the law, but that didn't seem to bother Lyndon very much. He did things like that that uh, most people um, never heard of. And um, I, I had, uh, well, anyway, the next uh, other president um, is um, Richard Nixon. And most people don't think of Nixon as somebody that loved the Jews. When you listen to the tapes, that were made in his office. He said the worst things possible about Jews. Jews this and well and all that kind of stuff. And But what he was talking about, to him, Jews were Democrats. They were American Jews who, and mostly Democrats, and they hated Nixon, and Nixon hated them. But when it came to Israel, Nixon thought the Israelis were the biggest heroes that um, the world has ever seen. He was kind of very divided in his mind about that. He was ready to help them because his mother had also planted a seed in him. She was a Quaker. And she said, Richard, one day you'll be in a powerful position. She was prophesying over him. And a situation will arise where Israel and the Jews need your help. When it does, you... Richard Nixon are to help them. And he never forgot this. And in 1973, when Israel was about to be overrun, and a message came that went through Kissinger to him from Golda Meir said, we need help. He was ready to do it. Even though he was entangled in Watergate, he was going down the drain. He saved Israel by sending them everything uh, we possibly could. There's many stories there, and I'm going to um, uh, skip some of those. So um, you can learn more about this. The next uh, president um, that did some things, and I really don't have time to go into it, was Ronald Reagan. 
And Ronald Reagan said this one thing that uh, I think he's very famous for. Uh, he said, if we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we'll be a nation that has gone under. Um, I want to talk about, um, and this is something I've never done before, and I'm a little hesitant to do it, but uh, I hope you'll be able to bear with me. I'm going to talk about four people. And um, these uh, people, uh, two on each side, came together and were married. But I'll, I'll tell that story how they met, because it has something to do with the presidency that I think is very important. And these are two streams that um, sort of commingled and impacted uh, the presidency of the United States. And um, I hope I, I don't confuse all of this. This is a friend of ours. Her name is Malky. Um, her last name is Weisberg. And Malky Weisberg lives in Jerusalem. Um, she was born in the United States, um, spent much of her younger life in the United States. Today, she's in Jerusalem, and she is a docent at the um, Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And she told me a story about her mother. And up in the right-hand corner is a picture of her mother, um, uh, about 90 years old at the time. She's passed on since then. But um, her mother's name uh, was uh, Revka. That was her nickname. Revka is uh, short for Rebecca. Um, and so this story about her starts the um, little story I'm going to tell you about four people. She's the first of the four people. And um, this uh, on the left is a picture of Revka when she's about 17. She is uh, from a town called Bukac. Today, uh, Bukac, uh, I believe, is in Poland. Uh, it was in Ukraine. It didn't move. It's just that those countries... Uh, kept getting uh, taken over by others. And anyway, Revka was born in Bukac. Her father was a rabbi, and he was a very elderly rabbi at the time she was born. His first wife had died after having given him six children. He married a younger woman, and the only child he had with uh, his new wife was uh, little Revka. And she was described by her mother as very headstrong and um, uh, probably spoiled because the rabbi took her with him everywhere he went. He was also a moil. And if you know what a moil is, it's uh, the rabbi who can do circumcisions. And he was over about 10,000 Jews in this town of Bukach. And he was very beloved by people. But little Revka went with him everywhere. And um, and all the people would say, oh, isn't she beautiful? Isn't she charming? She's so smart, all this kind of stuff kind of went to her head. And she was probably more headstrong um, than she uh, should have been. Well, anyway, uh, at about the age of 17, Revka had um, consented to marry a son of another rabbi from a, 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 a much larger Jewish town. This rabbi was like her father. They were kind of heads of a dynasty. And um, a, a letter had come three years prior when she was 14 from one rabbi to another and saying, I, I would like my son to marry your daughter. I think it would be the perfect match. Revka, of course, wanted nothing to do with this. Three years later, when she was about 17, these two families came together. They sat down at a table. This was a very solemn affair. And they signed a marriage contract. It's called a ketubah. And it's very ancient. As a matter of fact, it's still written today in Aramaic. And they said, uh, my son will marry uh, your daughter. Um, at such and such a time. It's not done immediately. It's not done within a couple of days. Oftentimes it could be a year or more before they're going to consummate the marriage. But technically, as soon as that is signed by the parents, they are married in the eyes of that branch of Judaism. And so um, they were married because the document was signed, but it was going to be some time in the future before they actually came together and consummated the marriage. In the interim, the 
a German army came in and along with them came the SS and they started rounding up Jews. They got her father and they said, I need to, to know the names of all the young men in your city here that you're in charge of because we want to protect these young Jewish men uh, from the Russians if they come in. And so give us their names and we're going to put them in work parties and uh, they'll be protected, but they're going to have to work. So he gave them the names and within a day or two, all of them were rounded up, taken out in the woods outside of Bukach and they were shot and murdered right there. When the rabbi understood what had happened, it so shocked him at his naivety and the fact that he had made this terrible mistake um, that he had a stroke, went to bed, and in a very short period of time, he was dead. Then the Nazis were rounding up the rest of the Jews, and they were putting them on trains and taking them away. And eventually, Revka and her mother were put on one of those trains that you see uh, in the background of that picture on the right-hand side. Um, and these people were told, you can bring a suitcase because we're only taking you out of the battle zone. There's no problem. It's just, I know this is a rough way to take you, but get on the trains and you'll be fine when you get there. Well, Revka didn't fall for this trick and she, started arguing with her mother as soon as they got in. And they had about a hundred people in one of these cars. And she said, this is wrong. I've, I, we've got to get out of here. When the doors were slammed, there were only these tiny slits up at the top that uh, served as uh, windows, but there was uh, barbed wire over it. And she said, mom, give me your blessing. I can crawl out of that window. And her mother said, no, you can't do this. I mean, after all, you are all I have. We have to stay together and th things are going to be fine. They promised us that. And this is a picture of a train a car, much like the one that she was on. So you can see those little windows up there at the top. And um, this is not an outhouse on the, on the top of it. This is a place where um, uh, one or two German soldiers were and uh, they had rifles in case anybody somehow um, got off of this train. And so she argued with her mother for about two hours. And when the train was going up a hill, it was going very slow, pulling many, many cars full of Jews um, up that hill. And finally, her mother said, okay, you have my blessing, you can go. Revka climbed on a barrel. She got up by that little slit of a window. She pulled the barbed wire off and she got halfway out of that window, looked back and saw her mother for the last time. She rolled out of that window, hit the uh, slope, rolled down um, basically into a cornfield and the Germans started shooting at her. And then she said, this was the first time I thought, what have I done? I don't know where I am. All I'm wearing is this dress. This was the dumbest thing I could have done. Oh my gosh, what have I done? And, uh, but of course, by that time, the train had gone by and the soldiers were, were continued to shoot in that cornfield, hoping to get her. Um, later, there were some others who also had some young boys who had uh, also got off another car. And uh, then they met up and they said, what are we going to do? We, we don't have a plan. And she says, I'm going back to Bukach. They said, you can't go back there. That's just where we came from. Um, because the, the Germans are there. She said, no, I have to go back because last week I had sold my engagement ring and I bought false papers that prove I'm a Polish girl. And she said, I've been practicing. I've learned how to cross myself. I've learned to do all the things that the Polish girls do. I, if I can get, find those papers, and that's why I got to go to Bukac, then I can get to Warsaw and I can hide um, as, a, as a Polish girl, which is what she did. And when she was in Warsaw, she was uh, hired by a Gentile family, and it was Christmas Eve, and she was doing all sorts of things with this family, and they asked her if she would serve Christmas Eve dinner. And so as she came in, there happened to be a Gentile who lived in Bukach who knew she, who she was. And he goes, Revka what are you doing here? I thought you were on that train. And of course, then she was unmasked. 
um, the people knew that they had this Jewish girl and they would be um, convicted. Uh, if, the, if the Nazis immediately found out they were hiding a Jew, they could be shot, and many people were for doing the very thing. They said, we, we can't risk the lives of our children, um, so you're going to have to go. And for the next uh, nearly four years, it was one escape after another um, where she would have been killed uh, almost immediately. The last thing that happened to her was she was grabbed by a, a, a Nazi, a German army, anti-aircraft battery and they were retreating toward Germany and they grabbed her off the street and they said you're our cook and she thought maybe she really was cooked here finally right at the end they were being bombed by American bombers and the Russians were coming and she was in a terrible spot and the war ended a peace came so you can imagine what Europe must have been like then there were uh, a million or more Jewish survivors, there were six million dead, but no one knew if anyone from their families had survived, and they're wandering around Europe trying to locate anybody who may have been even in their extended families. Revka ended up in a displaced persons camp, and in that camp, after a while, she started teaching children just to, just to, uh, kill the time, as it were, to find out if anybody from her family had uh, lived. And the word basically was no one had lived. And then she said, what about this guy that I was engaged to? Because if he is still alive, we are married. If he's not alive, I have to prove that he's dead or I cannot marry um, later in life. She's, I think she's about 21 now. And so she went to the rabbi and she said, Rabbi, I'm leaving the, deep, the displaced persons camp. I'm going back to Bukat. She said, don't go back there. We hear that Jews that go back to Poland are being murdered in the streets by the Poles because they think you're coming back to get your house. And she said, I'm sorry, but I'm going back. I can't live like this. And if I can't prove that he is dead, um, my fiance, whose, whose name, by the way, was Israel. If I can't prove Israel is dead, then I can never marry the rest of my life. I've got to try to find proof for this. And so that was settled and the rabbi was dismayed. And later that day, maybe it was the next day, I'm not sure of that, a young man comes into the camp and he came to a group of rabbis sitting there. It was Friday afternoon. And he said, I'm searching for someone, a loved one, and they said, okay, look, it's almost Shabbat. It's almost Sabbath. Come back on Sunday, and we'll take care of you. And he looked so down in the face that the, the rabbi who knew Revka said, come on, walk with me. Tell me your story, and by Sunday, maybe I can work something out. So he said, well, I'm looking for a loved one. And um, he said, okay, yeah, so is uh, another million people wandering around Europe. Um, who is it? He said, well, it's uh, my, my fiance. Okay, and what's her name? He said, her name is Esther. He said, Esther, every Jewish girl in the world's named Esther. That doesn't, did she have a nickname? He said, yeah, her nickname is Revka. Revka? Where's she from? He said, oh, it's a town you never heard of. It's called Bukac. Revka from Bukac? Really? Is that it? He said, yeah, Revka from Bukach, why? And I think the young man thought that the rabbi said, okay, your search is over. That the word now was that uh, the rabbi knew she was dead and that's the end of it. And he looked so bad. He said, well, no, 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 you don't understand. Revka is alive. Revka is here. She's in the camp. Well, I think she's still here. We got to find her right away before she leaves. And so they did find her. And of course, the, I can make the story shorter. They got married. This is Revka here in the middle. Next to her is the, man, the young man she was engaged to named Israel. All of these people at their wedding, none of their family members had survived. And you can see they were all about the same age. These were people with no families left whatsoever. In a short period of time, and they used some false papers. Somehow they got to Belgium, then they got to Brazil, and they were in Brazil for five years, Revka and Israel. 
and he had a job there as a kind of an assistant rabbi. Then they went to California, and then they said, we have children now. Malky was one of those children. And they said, we want to put them in a good Jewish school, and there's nothing here in California, so let's go to New York. And so when they got to New York, um, he met with the um, Jewish authorities, and they said, you want to be a rabbi? You must be crazy. We've got more rabbis, and we know what to do with. We have hundreds of thousands of refugees, Jews, who have come to the United States after the war, and... Um, and there were, there's too many rabbis, uh, there's nothing for you. And they go, wait a minute, you know what? I kind of remember something. There is an apartment over in Brooklyn. And in that apartment are, who knows how many, thousand refugees over there. None of them are religious. They'll probably hate you, rabbi. But um, why don't you go ahead and give it a try? Maybe you can get 10 together and form a minion. Who knows uh, what'll happen? So. Uh, the rabbi and Revka moved uh, into that apartment. And in a short period of time, he was having more than 100 Jews coming to his uh, meetings. And uh, they were meeting, though, in the basement of that um, apartment building, which doubled as a parking lot. It's the 1950s. What did people do? They went down and they started their cars and they let them run and all the exhaust was down there and melted snow and water and everything. And it was uh, very poor. And so his um, people said to him, Rabbi, go see the, why don't you go see the landlord? Maybe the landlord will help you um, uh, give us a room that we can meet in. He said, I'm not going to meet that. I'm not going to see that rabbi. I mean that landlord, because I know that uh, he's a German, but he says, and this is him on the right, he says he's a Swede. He, he's not a Swede, I can tell. And you can imagine how Jews felt about Germans. Eventually he went to see him, and this is the man uh, that he came to see, and he said, I have a problem. Um, I'm a rabbi, and I'm a rabbi in a building that you run. You, you may not know who I am, but uh, we don't have a place to meet, and this gentleman in that nice suit says to him, well, your problem is this, you need a synagogue. He said, well, that's true. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a piece of property that I own and you can build a synagogue on it. And the rabbi said, well, that's extremely kind of you, but we couldn't rub two shekels together if we had them. He said, no, look, I'll build it. And um, you can pay me back on some of these kind of things as we go along. And every year I'll give you a uh, a, a nice donation. And then he would always end their conversation with this rabbi because over the years they became best of friends along with their wives. And for 50 years, these two couples were very good friends. And um, the, uh, the rabbi was hesitant to go see him because first of all, not because of his first name, his first name was Frederick, but his middle name was Christ. This is not a name that attracts rabbis. And so um, when he got to know Frederick Christ, um, it, over the years, the rabbi would come to F Fred and he'd say, you know, there's a family that's in dire need of help. And immediately Fred would write a check and say, he'd give it to him. And then he'd always remind him, he said, listen, rabbi, you and I worship the same God. Don't forget that rabbi. So he's giving theological lessons to the rabbi. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to cut this a little bit short and not do everything I threatened you with, um, but uh, time is running out. I forgot to tell you the name of this um, landlord. His last name is Trump, Fred Trump. And guess who his son <laughs> is? And I don't think it takes much um, to figure that one out. This is a picture of Fred Trump and Rabbi Israel Wagner. And the notation says, thanking you for another generous donation that you've done to help us with our synagogue. And the beautiful lady um, on the right side of the screen is the woman who Fred Trump married. And I was going to make this part of a mystery and tell you about her because she's got a wonderful background 
a very Christian background, and she comes out of a family that was responsible for starting a revival, a very well-documented revival um, in the Hebrides Islands off of Scotland. So what I'm saying is this, these two um, families um, became fast friends, and out of this came um, Donald Trump. And um, it, this was going to be very clever of me to show this to you, but now that I've blown it, um, this is a picture in the background, and that's Fred Trump, and that's his wife, Mary. And then here is Israel Wagner and uh, Revka, his wife. And then um, you can see this is a picture in the Oval Office of the White House. And there's Donald's family there, and these other people, of course, had a big influence on him because they were friends for 50 years, and Donald observed them. And Monkey um, remembers Donald Trump as a 14-year-old. She said he was this wild-haired, uh, overly energetic young kid. And every Sunday morning, he was in our um, laundry room in the apartment, and he was collecting the quarters out of the machines. And that was a job that his father had given him. Anyway, um, I hope that uh, some people said, ooh, that's one of the reasons why Trump um, has been so good to Israel, and, and it is. And so I'm going to wrap this up here. I've gone an hour, and I don't know if any of you have lasted uh, during that, but um, another time we'll tell you the Christian side of how his mother probably raised Donald Trump and the seeds that were planted in him. There were two seeds planted in him that really blossomed when he got to the White House. And that's how God works with those five, worked with those five people incredibly to bring a blessing to our nation because they blessed um, the, the Jewish people. So Lori, are you still awake? <laughs> um, Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, are you kidding? I could go on for another hour. There's just so much. And this was just an overview. So I think that was so fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I, you know, if anybody has a, we can spend a few more minutes if anybody has any questions. Um, John, can you, I want you to show us, um, tell us about your um, book. Where can they buy it if they want to buy the book? Because this was just a touch it, you know, a tip of the iceberg on the book. Uh, also tell us about Zion's Watchmen. But uh, does anybody have any questions? If you have a question, uh, let's see if I can get this on. Okay, there's the book information. If you want to take a screenshot of that, anybody, you can take a quick screenshot of that information. And I think I'll do the same thing. I can send it to everybody in an email. Okay. Yeah, a very um, uh, easy way to do it. If You'll either call that number, that's um, my number. I'll send it to you. Um, and it's cheaper than buying it uh, online. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to do that. There's no charge on the mailing. Um, this book is $20. And the other two are, um, let me see here. <laughs> They're $10 each. So this is The Rise and Fall of the British Empire and the one about the Holocaust. And uh, that's how to get them the most inexpensive way and I'm glad to do that. So either call that phone number and leave a message or um, that's my email address. Send that and send your address along with it and I'll send them to you. Fantastic, okay. Any questions real quick before we um, bring this presentation to an end? If you have a question, you can unmute yourself. Okay, okay, let's see if we can do. Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, I did want to acknowledge a couple of people that are here with us tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, this book um, that John just um, wrote about the presidents was um, a seed planted by our dear friend Rita Adams, who is also here with us. Or she was, I'm not sure if she's still on the call. She may have to get off. Oh, there she is. Hey, Rita. Hi, good to see you, my friend. Uh, Rita was the one who um, knew the wealth of information John has and all the work you've done for the years. They're very close friends. 
and uh, she encouraged me to do this, and here we are. Well, uh, the other person that's here tonight that was also impactful in that book was Linda Smith. Linda, if you'll wave to everybody. Linda is part of, uh, was part of the editing team for that book. So these women are um, really a part of the reason the book was encouraged and actually came to fruition. So thank you all for doing that. Um, and thank you for joining us tonight. And then we have Ian Stacy from the Fort Worth area who is here tonight, who I was a able to hear John for the first time with this presentation just a week ago at Ann's home. And I was so moved by this story about this book that I said, can you please come do a Zoom presentation? We'll try to get more people to know about this information. So thank you all for coming. Um, I will send a follow-up email if you have any questions after we get off the Zoom call. Please don't hesitate to email me or you now have John's email. Um, John, fantastic presentation. We're gonna have you back. We're gonna have a series. We're gonna have a follow-up on this. Uh, Dennis, I see you popped in. Do you have a question before we hang up? You're muted, my friend. You want to unmute? Let's see. There we go. Question. Just really enjoyed this very much. I've enjoyed uh, reading the book. It's wonderful. <laughs> what I love is uh, the instant connection as I saw that with Truman in 1948, and Johnson in 67, and, and uh, Nixon in 73. I just thought that was really awesome. I had never connected the dots there. Wonderful. Well, Dennis, thank you <laughs> for that. Very nice to um, see you this way. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I have this weird, weird connections with Lyndon Johnson. My grandfather knew him very well. Uh, his grandson, Lyndon, was my attorney in San Antonio. And uh, I insure some of his family members today. I'm an insurance broker. So, uh, the Re Rebecca Bates Johnson. Foundation and Lucy as well. So it's just really kind of weird to read that book. I never knew those stories. Well, you know, this it. is this might be something you can tell um, Lyndon, the lawyer, that um, after uh, baby Lyndon was born, um, his father, Sam Ely Jr., couldn't get around to coming up with a name. And this went on for a long period of time. And finally, his mother said, I am not getting out of this bed until you name him. And so there was this standoff. And uh, evidently, the name Lyndon was a lawyer. And maybe he was in Johnson City. And so that's how uh, he finally got a name after, after this standoff between his parents. So, and, and maybe I'm sure the, the grandson uh, knows this story, but... Uh, that's awesome. Anyway. <laughs> It was, a, it was a funny situation. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you guys again for joining us. Thank you, John. We will be following up with the, the next Zoom presentation. We're going to dive deeper into these presidents. And then what we hope to do is also have John back to do a presentation uh, on the other two books. Those probably won't be, a, just, that'll probably be just a one-time presentation on those books, but who knows, maybe more. We'll see. So, uh, Lori? Yes. This is Ron Dubner, and I, I wanted, this was a great presentation, and I wanted to mention something to John about Fred Trump. Uh, my cousin, uh, who grew up in New York, uh, his parents lived in an apartment owned by Fred, and he spoke to them in Yiddish. <laughs> he, uh, oh, oh my so he had, uh, he had a, a even deeper thing so i thought that would be interesting to to mention it There's is interesting presentation i look forward to the next one i'll have to rewrite the whole chapter now thank <laughs> you <Ron. laughs> it was great thank you thank you thanks for coming ron thank you yeah. okay. great larry uh thank you very much you're welcome guys all right friends thanks for coming again and we'll be in touch soon with the next one Everyone have a happy Hanukkah, Shabbat Shalom, Merry Christmas, and uh, we wish you all a, a, a blessing from Texas. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody.